If you pay attention to your own uh, experience, you'll start to discover the truth of it. You'll start to discover how much time you spend in mind wandering, how much time you spend in thinking about yourself, thinking about the past and the future, thinking about what you're worried about, what you're afraid of, thinking about what you want, thinking about all of those things that take you away from being available to life. And so if it is the case that you're spending at least 50% of your time uh, in mind wandering and not being available to life, it means that you're only, you're only present to life half the time. And then, you know, I would venture to say, and I think it's pretty safe to say that it's probably greater than 50% for a lot of people. But that's bad enough, you know? If you're not present for life half the time, it means that you're, you don't have a life. You're living in your head. You're living in a mental state. You're living in a thinking world, not in the real world. You're living in a world that's an interpretation of what's happening, not a, a connection with it and not a perception of it, an awareness of it. This is important to understand. And you know, when, when I give talks to people who are new at meditation, I try and make it clear to them that you're paying a price not to practice meditation, that you're paying a price to remain ignorant. You're paying a price to stay in the mental framework that is the patterns of your life. And, uh, and, and, and what you want more than anything else as a human being, which is to be happy, which is to be at peace, which is to be, feel at home in your body, which is to be able to enjoy your life, can't possibly be available to you if you spend at least 50% of your time not even in your life, but in your head about your life. And then there's another, uh, there's an, an, some other percentage of time that you spend being upset um, and acting out emotions, being confused. Um, and so the, the, if you add it all up, most human beings, if they're going to be perfectly honest about their experience of life, um, that life becomes a miserable reality. It's a miserable situation to, to have to wake up to every day. And even if you're successful, and even if you've done all the work that they tell you you need to do in order to be happy and successful and satisfied in life, you'll start to discover that it's not working. You know, that the, all, all the hard work you did and all the money you earned to get that Maserati, and now the Maserati is a pain in the ass because you have to worry about how expensive it is to get an oil change. And you have to worry about if somebody were to hit my Maserati, you know, what would that be like for me, right? So you'd start to discover that all the things you've been doing to succeed and be in control and win in life aren't working. Yeah, they, work, they work temporarily to keep you in the game. You know, I, I often refer to it as kind of a casino relationship. People have a casino relationship with life, meaning that as long as you win every once in a while, you keep, you keep playing, just like the casino works. And just like the, in the casino, in the casino, the house wins, right? That's how casinos survive, the house wins, by keeping the players playing, right? But in life, nobody wins. You don't win and life doesn't win, nobody wins. So to come to terms with the typical human life means to face the fact that life is not workable or life is miserable or confusing or stressful. Now, this is the, the evidence speaks very, very much so for that when you look at the fact that um, how many people are on medication for depression and anxiety, when you look at how many people are uh, on uh, suffering from addictions from alcohol and, and other kinds of addictions. Um, so the evidence is there that speaks pretty clearly that mental illness is probably the, the disease of mankind. Mental illness is the disease of mankind. You know, because what we consider normal, if you look closer at what's considered normal, right, it's pretty neurotic, right, it's pretty neurotic. That's why if you go to the movies and you look at a movie that's about a typical contemporary person, right? You sit in a movie and you laugh at how crazy they are. You're looking at yourself. That's why you're laughing, right? 
That's what comedy is. It's taken out of the context of everyday life and, life and presented to you. Uh, and so you can see the absurdity of the whole thing. So the, the reality of it is, is what meditation is really about. It's coming to terms with the truth. It's coming to terms with reality. It's facing reality. And, and the first step in, uh, in the practice of meditation, if it's going to be used to come out of the misery, if it's going to be used to become healthy mentally and psychologically, the first step is disillusion, disillusionment. Disillusionment. You know, if you're disillusioned, then you're ripe for meditation, right? Meaning that you, you, that you recognize you don't want to keep going the same way. You don't want to end up in old age and having a, have not accomplished anything in terms of your relationship to life. So you could say, you know, people don't have any problem uh, putting money away for retirement, right? Uh, but at the same time, those very same people have uh, a problem spending some time every day sitting quietly and being silent and practicing being aware of their true nature and being aware of reality as reality actually is. That's pretty ignorant, in my opinion. You're not investing in your own life. You're not investing in your own happiness. You're not investing in the possibility that is always available to all of us uh, to enjoy life, you know, to, 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 especially if you are in, uh, blessed with the circumstances that most of us are here in the West, here in this country, the richest country in the world, right, has the most people in prison than any other country in the world, has the largest uh, number of people addicted and mentally ill, richest country in the world, and has all of those other things going at the same time. So if you want to come out of it, if you don't want to be part of the herd that's running off the cliff, Right, then you have to take a stand for something. You have to, if you see, if you're disillusioned and you see that it's not working and you see that you're paying too high of a price, then you have to take a stand for something. And to educate yourself about um, meditation, if you're going to do it the way it's meant to be done, the way it was intended, means to educate yourself about what they call the Dharma or the teaching or the truth. And this is not particular to any particular religion. It's true in mystical Christianity, it's there in Sufism, it's there in Buddhism, it's, it's even there in Greek philosophy, okay? The idea of realizing that there has to be a way of being in this life and in this world that allows you to be happy and free. But if that way of being happy in this life and in this world involves uh, trying to get that to happen, at the relative level, in other words, to try and get that to happen in the physical world or in the world of time and all those kinds of things, it doesn't work. But what the mystics tell us and what the teachers, uh, wisdom teachers tell us is that's not a problem because our true nature is timeless, because our true nature is not physical. And so if you do the work and do the practices to experience the truth of yourself as the awareness that's always been there, that's been being ignored, which is what the word ignorance means, it's being ignored. But instead of ignoring it, you start to pay attention to it. And when you're paying attention to it, you start to understand and realize that this awareness that you're, is in your actual nature is free, is peaceful, is silent, is timeless, it's not going anywhere, it's naturally happy, it's spontaneous, it's creative, it's inventive, it has no, no limit to its wisdom and intelligence. Right? So th this is obviously the, the, the third phase of life for human beings. If you progress out of identifying yourself of, as a physical body and a personality. But the world, the world at large right, is still stuck in the personality mode. The world at large is still stuck in the personality mode. And as, as long as you're stuck in that mode where you think you're separate from life and separate from everybody else, then the kinds of things that you see on the news make sense, right? Because if somebody is threatening you and your family and threatening you physically and threatening you my, your finances and so forth, right? Then in that state of mind and in that emotional state, it's, it makes sense to fight. It makes sense to do all the things that we see happening in the world. The problem is that's not reality. Problem is it doesn't need to be that way. The problem is it is possible if we were able to take the resources we have and spend them on the right things, right? Everybody on the planet would get fed. 
There'd be education for everybody on the planet. There'd be, you know, there'd be support for everybody on the planet, right? But that's not going to happen as long as the the major percentage of the finances and, and the and the money that we have in the world is being spent on weapons, being spent on weapons. So the thing is this: if so, the first step is you've you've got to face the facts of life. You have to come out of your fantasies and start to see the world as it is. You have to, to come out of your justifications and your ways of identifying yourself as a personality and distracting yourself and kidding yourself and li living in this pretense. You've got to be willing to put that aside for a while and look at the truth and see what's possible for yourself. So that's the first step. Yeah. So this isn't going to get sorted out immediately. It's going to take some time for you to expose yourself to some teachings and to come to some understanding about what's going on in the inner world. You know, what's happening in my brain? What, what is the mind? What's happening in my mind? You know, is it possible to understand how all this works so I can, you know, have some say so about the realizing this possibility for myself? And the answer is yes, but that's what I was saying. You have to start out with a, a honest examination, an honest perception of the reality of your life as a human being and see it for what it really is. And if you do that, and because you do that, you come to a conclusion that if there is an alternative, if there's another way to do this, if there's an answer that I don't know about, then I want to know about it. I want to find out about it. So you become a seeker, right? So that's what happened. You become a seeker. And then you start to get involved with reading and studying and practicing some of these teachings and practices that come from thousands of years ago where people claim that they saw a way. There was a way. In fact, one of the teachings is called the way in, in Chinese, the, the teachings of the Tao, the way, by, Tao Te, by Lao Tse. So that's the first step. The second step is then you begin to do the practices and you begin to do some of the listening to the teachings and reading some books and so forth, and you start to develop some understanding of things. You start to develop uh, some way of seeing things where you see more than you saw before. You see some possibility there. And so you, you begin to practice meditation, you begin to study these things. But then what you see is that that starts to compete with your other activities. That starts to compete with your other interests. That starts to become something that you get distracted from because you're too busy, you're, you're too upset, um, you don't feel good physically, you don't have enough time, and all the things that people say about meditation. But therein lies a place where there is a, a, a division ha happens. The consumer type people who are interested in stress reduction and the consumer form of meditation, right? That's where they stay and then other people move on to a more serious uh, and intense utilization of meditation for, for a psychodynamic change, for a psychological change. And that's how I got interested in this as a psychologist. Right? Because in my life, early on in my life, I was studying all these psychological theoretical models with the idea that I could use this stuff. I could become a psychologist and help other people, but mainly I could use this stuff on my own life, you know, because I came from a horror show. So I could use this stuff on my own life to, to, to kind of get myself together and get my life together and at the same time be able to help other people. So I thought it was a good idea. The only problem is after going through all those years of school and getting a a doctorate degree and a license as a psychologist, I felt pretty inadequate. I felt pretty inadequate because I, the reality of it is, and any psychotherapist that is being honest will say the same thing, the reality of it is we really don't help people that much at all. We don't help people that much at all. Because what we're doing is we're working, we're st the premise of the process of psychotherapy, of, of psychotherapy begins with a lie. It begins with a lie. And I didn't even realize this in the beginning, but it does. It begins with a lie. And the lie is that you're a physical body and you're a person and a personality. And we're going to treat you as that, right? And the way we're going to treat you as that is we're going to examine you and come up with a diagnosis, meaning we're going to find out what's wrong with you, and then we're going to fix that. And that's all the theoretical models are all about that stuff. That's the conventional approach to psychology. And I was frustrated with it because I didn't see it producing a, a lot of results. Uh, and then when I started to look into some of the Eastern wisdom teachings and started to realize that this was a completely different model. 
This was a completely different model. And in this model, they start with the truth. And the truth they start with is you are the awareness that's aware of your life. You're the awareness that's aware of your life. You're not the physical body and you're not a personality. The personality was something that got, uh, was your conditioning. You learned to be who you think you are, right? And part of that learning was that you're a physical body. But if you look closely and you look further, you can come to see that this is actually very superficial and it's not actually the truth. And then the question is, well, if I'm not that, then what am I? And you can actually go through a process and come up with a direct experience of the truth of what you are, which is awareness itself. So then if you do that, and I've talked about the, that here, and I said, that's the first thing you wanna do. You wanna pay attention to where you're coming from. You wanna pay attention to, you know, when you're, when you're looking, right? When you're looking, what's using your eyeballs? When you're looking, what's looking? When you're listening, what's listening? Right? This, is, this is a way of starting to get involved in finding out the truth about yourself. And if you turn your attention and go back to the source of your experience, whether we're talking about your visual experience or your auditory experience, what you get to right, is there's an awareness that's aware of what you see. There's an awareness that hears what you hear. There's an awareness that feels what you touch. Right? And that awareness is constant. It's always there. It's formless. It's spoken about in the Heart Sutra when they say emptiness is form and form is emptiness. So you can, at, at some point, if you pursue this, you start to get on to something, and then you start to realize, oh, this is a possibility that I can realize. I can realize my true nature. I can realize what's, what is really true about life. And I can start living that truth, and I can experience what that has to offer me. However, Right? However, that's, that's great, that's a good idea, right? But unless you, you make a commitment to that process, because it's gonna take a commitment, to continue to practice meditation, to continue to learn and deepen your understanding, and have that be a priority. Have that be a priority, because what are we talking about here? We're talking about whether or not you're experiencing your life the way life can be experienced in terms of being happy and enjoying your life and being satisfied so that when the end of your life comes, you will have been here and you will feel that, it, you, that your life was real and you lived it and you experienced uh, the, the fulfillment of the possibility of a human life. That's a good death, okay? So that's what people want. But now, as you well know, those of you who have been practicing, right, it ain't all that simple, is it? No. So, what it's going to take is that you first of first things, you, what you have to do is you have to establish what George Gurdjieff called a, is an aim. You have to create an aim for yourself. What are you aiming at, you see? What are you aiming for? If you recognize this possibility that you can realize that what, of, uh, about what you really are, and it offers you peace, and it offers you uh, satisfaction and happiness and well-being, if you're aiming for that, right, can you maintain your aim on that? Because if you can maintain your, maintain your aim on that, that means that you're living your life in such a way where that priority is always being addressed. That's the aim. You can't accomplish this casually. You can't change your brain casually. It won't work, okay? It's already too far gone. That's not gonna work. But what you can do is stop identifying with the thinking, stop identifying with what you're not, start experiencing the awareness that you are, and just the, continue, just the consistent experience of that will get the job done. Just the consistent experience of that will get the job done. What I've said here many times is if you shine the light of awareness, right? If you shine the light of awareness that can see things that can see what's real, if you shine that on what's happening in your, in your mind or in your life or in your body, right? Just the awareness of it will get the job done. Just the awareness of it will self-correct. Why? Because the awareness is seeing what's happening and it's, it, it can recognize that what's happening is inconsistent with the truth. It can recognize that, immediately can recognize that. 
And because it can recognize that, it can start to have the change that's occurring go in the direction of the truth. That's the way the practice works. By applying the practice, the, the cha because change is a constant, right? Change is going to continue to happen, right? But the change that occurs after you wake up, the change that occurs after you are aware and you can shine the light of that awareness to illuminate the reality of your life, then the change that's already occurring starts to move in a direction that will have the way you are be consistent with the truth. That's just a natural process that happens if you continue to do the practices and you continue to invest yourself in the teachings. But there has to be strong determination. Strong determination has to be part of this project. If, if, the, if the determination is not strong enough, then as soon as the right thing comes up, the right thoughts happen, the right feelings happen, right? Then you're off the path, right? Then you're off the path. Then you skip that day of meditation. Then you start, then you start talking yourself out of it, right? I don't know, I don't really have too much time to read the spiritual material anymore. Maybe I can go to the casino and win. <laughs> then I can test whether money is the answer or not. I want to test it. I don't want to just find out. I want to, I want to have, you know, that's what people say. Money may not make me happy, but I'll talk to me after I have some and then we can come to a conclusion, right? But that's really a sad way to deal with this because the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that money doesn't make people happy. So how much time are you going to invest in that losing you know, that losing process, right? Better that you should get clear sooner, better that you should make the kind of commitment that it takes and have the kind of strong determination that it takes in order to see this project through, in order to stay awake as consistently as possible so that your brain doesn't keep creating a dream that you end up having to live your life in. In order to do that, you're going to have to have strong determination. And this is one of the reasons why people go to these retreats, okay? Because if I'm, have, see, if I'm having trouble maintaining a consistent meditation practice, right? And I'm having trouble because I keep getting confused about what this is all about and so forth. And because of that, I go to a place where there is a very highly qualified and experienced teacher. And for seven days, I am going to throw, put my life in this... Uh, experience of, of the intense practice of meditation and the intense study of, of the teachings and the practices and talk to a qualified teacher and I'm going to do this for a week straight more than I've ever done it before in my life and you know when I talk about this possibility even here but to, to anybody they people start saying oh no <laughs> oh no seven days without talking to anybody and, and practicing seven or eight sessions in one day Oh, no, no, I can't do that. That's about as clear communication from the ego as you're ever going to hear. Right? The ego will speak up. <laughs> you know? You start presenting the ego with the opportunity uh, for it to be seen for what it really is, and it will speak up and say, Oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't do that. Don't even try to do that. Right? And that's one of the reasons that I say if you're going to go to one of these retreats, the only way you can pull it off, the way I pull it off, is I don't think about it. I know it's good for me. I know it could be very powerful in terms of uh, moving the process uh, of, of awakening, moving the process of, of seeing things clearly and consistently. I know that it can do that. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to use strong determination. It's a lot easier to use strong determination if you're in a, 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 uh, an environment like that where you're at a meditation intensive because you're with a group of people and you don't want to be the one that fails. Which is, in this context, it's a good thing. That'll keep you involved. That'll keep you doing. That'll, it'll, it'll take you past where you would otherwise fail. It'll take you past that. And so you just press through it. You know, every day you're sitting. And, you know, one of our people from this community went up there in, at Ithaca at the Zen Center that I practice at. You know, it's, it's got to be more intense than, than any other time you've ever experienced it. And one of the reasons that I did that was because I was curious, and curiosity is, is, is an important part of this process. You know, wouldn't it be interesting for you to be curious of what would it be like to spend seven days talking to nobody, to spend seven days doing uh, seven, six or seven or eight meditation sessions each day, to have an interview with an experienced uh, consciousness teacher every day, right? 
to follow a system that's designed to keep you out of your head all day long. What would it be like to do that for seven days? How, you know, what would that experience be like? I was very curious of what it would be like, and I wanted to find out. So the, the only way you can find out is go there and put yourself in the experience. It won't kill you. I mean, people act as if it will kill you, right? So that's an, op that's an option, is to do an intensive like that. And there are a lot less intensive things that you can do. They have one-day things, two-day things, three-day things. But I think that type of thing is important at some point along the process because you have to put yourself in a situation where you can test your determination. How strong is your determination? How determined are you to realize your true nature? How determined are you to wake up and stop coming from these patterns that your brain's generating? How determined are you? Can you see the relationship between how determined you are and whether or not you are very clear about the unworkability of life without this? Can you see the relationship? If you, if you can really get the relationship, and I've said this here before, I've said that one of the ways you know whether somebody really gets this, gets these teachings and these practices, if they really get these teachings and practices, then they have no trouble seeing very clearly for themselves that this is the most important thing you can do in your life. That's why people go to monasteries. Because they feel that this, there is no, without this, and without this possibility, and without, without this ha, what this has to offer me, my life isn't worth living anyway. What am I going to do? Just be another miserable asshole? That's the, that's the, that's the bottom line, isn't it, Nick? What am I going to do? Just be another miserable asshole? What am I going to do? Just fly off the cliff with the rest of these people that are heading towards annihilation? You know, that's where the human race is heading, right? And when I say that, I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm, I'm saying the scientists that know these things say that we have a very short period of time left before the human race is annihilated, and they ain't kidding, okay? So if that's true, how do you want to spend your time, <laughs> you see? Yeah, if that's true, how do you want to? You should spend your time the way somebody spends their time that's been given a terminal diagnosis. You should spend your time the way somebody spends their time that's been given a terminal diagnosis and realizes the value of life. And so from the time they get that diagnosis until the time they stop breathing, right, everything changes. All the things they thought were so important ain't so important anymore, right? And now I don't have time to waste. I don't have time to be crazy. I don't have time to be neurotic. I have to really be here and experience being here because the experience is going to come to an end very shortly. There was a, 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 a pretty famous spiritual teacher. His name was Stephen Levine. And he worked with, in hospice in San Francisco. Uh, and he worked in hospice for years with people who were dying to help them have a good death. And he wrote a book about it, and I forget the exact name of the book, but it was something about one year to live or something like that. You can't afford to assume you have time, right? You don't have time. That's, there's no question about it. You don't have time. You can't afford to assume that, that you don't have time. So if you're smart, you, you start to live your life as if you've been given a terminal diagnosis, because you do have a terminal diagnosis, don't you? And if you, don't, if you keep ignoring that, right, then you're just wasting your life. You're wasting the opportunity to be here and experience being alive. The time you spend in your head, the time you spend thinking, the time you spend worrying, the time you spend upset, the time you spend complaining, you're not experiencing life. Life is going by and you're not there. You're in your head worrying about the whole thing. But, but the thing is this, what I want to leave you with tonight is I want you to take a, take a look at yourself and ask yourself, do I get this? Do I really get this? If I really get this, am I acting consistent with what I get? Am I practicing this in a way that gives it the importance that it really does have? Am I determined enough to deal with it the way it needs to be dealt with? These are good questions to ask yourself. And if the answer is that you're not, then you may want to do a little bit of inquiry into why is that the case? Why are you willing to turn your back on life? Because that's basically what you're doing. Why are you willing to turn your back on life? So, self, you know, strong determination is the word I want you to leave with. Strong determination. You're going to need that in order for this to work. And if you put, and that's one of the reasons that I did, I did the intensives that I did, is because you have to be determined to do it, and you have to maintain a strong determination to sit there, 
to sit there. Uh, when I was early in my, the beginning of my practice of meditation, I used to sit down in a meditation posture for maybe 90 minutes or two hours, right? Just to exercise my determination. That's all I was doing. Just to exercise my determination. To allow myself to experience that I can do this for two hours. It's not true that it's impossible. I can be here, I can sit here for two hours and watch my breath and keep coming back to my breath. It's a good thing to find out, isn't it? So you know you have the wherewithal to do this. Yeah. That determination has to be a lifetime determination. Of course. It's, of course. It's, you, not, that's, it's not like until I get there. It's, it's, there's nowhere to get. It's, it's, there's nowhere to get. For the rest of your life. And that's why I said you have to create an aim. You have to create this determination and this aim that you have is a, an aim that you're setting for your life. You're not setting it for a day, you're setting it for your life. So it's gonna have an effect on how you live for the rest of your life. That's what I mean by an aim, right? So look and see whether, you, whether you've handled these things, whether you've given this stuff attention or not, so that you can carry on with the process and get the results available. Gabish? <laughs> All right, see you next time.